And we are live. Welcome to Beyond the Fundamentals. Does God hate some people? Does God hate some people? This is a study on ego and authenticity. And I want to bring together three things for you that occurred to me recently that was kind of a kind of a crazy revelatory insightful moment that three things connected for me suddenly and I want to share those things with you today and try to piece together something and it's uh, good to see at least one person in the chat good to see Seraphim here I'm sure others will follow and I'll tell you the three things that I want to connect, and I want to start with a quote first. And I do want to say that tomorrow we've got Seraphim Winslow coming on. He's going to be live at 4 p.m. Central Time. I also have coming up a video on 1 Corinthians 3.8. Somebody asked me, how does that not support Calvinism? So we're going to talk about that one. And I also have a video coming up talking about transformational elements found in the original Avatar movie that came out in 2009. Now, I know the sequel just came out. We're not going to be talking about the sequel. We're going to be talking about the first one. All right, so we got some ideas. We got some uh, things brewing right now that, I, that I'm pretty excited about. And I'm really excited about what I want to talk about today. And I'm also really excited about tomorrow's with Seraphim talking about the Perusia Part 2 coming of Christ, and I'm really excited about the 1 Corinthians 3, 8, because I, I see kind of all this stuff kind of blending and melding together. I would ask you to um, bear with me on my voice and ability to breathe today. It, looks, it seems like I kind of caught a little cold from my son. I also want to say thanks to everyone who has so generously supported the channel recently. We could not do this without you. I want to lead off with a quotation from our buddy Alexander Solzhenitsyn. He said, the dividing line, <clears throat> the line dividing good and evil cuts through the heart of every human being. And another way that I've heard this is the dividing line between good and evil runs through every heart. It depends on how it's translated. And when he said this statement, he had, he wound up as a prisoner in the gulags, but had not long before that considered becoming one of the prison guards or one of the administrative people. And as he was walking alongside one of the guards, he realized that there was only one decision, one, one small decision difference between him and the other guy. And he kind of realized that they are the same. Seraphim says he's got a big surprise for everybody tomorrow. That makes me nervous. What's going to happen? So the three things that I want to talk about right now, I'm gonna and, I'm, and I apologize for these being so sm such small font, okay? And I'll try to make them bigger, but I I have to arrange things as I see them in my head. And I have over here this idea: Does God hate some people? And then another thought that I think is related to this is the outer man versus the inner man, as it's found in Romans seven. We're going to be looking about Romans Romans seven. And we're going to be looking at Galatians chapter 6, verse 7, our understanding of God. I see all these things, I see all these things as connected, and I want to, okay, that quote originally comes from Dostoevsky. I want to show you why I think they're connected, and I think that when I connect this, when I show you why it's connected, I think it's going to help you see a lot of things in Scripture much more clearly, and I think it's also going to help you to perceive how you should prehend your future self more clearly, which is what I want to do. So, does God hate some people? Well, it kind of seems like the Bible says that he does in Psalm 5 5, Psalm 10 3, Leviticus 20 23, Proverbs 6. And I'm going to mix this. This other thought occurred to me with. Uh, Paul talking about the sin that he's doing. He says, it's, it's no longer I that do it, but sin that dwells in me. And so we're going to talk about what, what could be called the false self versus the authentic self or the ego versus the authentic self. 
the comparison of the, or what the Bible calls the old man and the new man, the inner man and the outer man. What you call it really doesn't matter, really doesn't matter. The Bible has terms for these, and then uh, mankind has also developed terms for these, and it doesn't matter what you call it, it's the same thing. The new man, the old man, the inner man, the outer man, that kind of thing. And then our understanding of God, we're going to talk about the future, the law of sowing and reaping, and the concept of your future self, and how these things uh, relate to what we're talking about today. Let's look at these passages. Now, this is kind of salient as we've been dealing with uh, as we've been dealing with Calvinists, right? <clears throat> I see Seraphim saying he hates the deeds but not the people themselves, and that's always the answer we got, and we always fought back. And I'll show you how we did. Okay, and so the these answers, these passages are here. And now notice I'll say that God's hate is always conditioned on iniquity. It's never unconditional or decreed in advance. And I, and I noticed before I came on here that I don't have uh, I don't have Esau on here, but that's not the point, okay? Um, it's it, That wasn't intentionally that I left that out. I got a whole video on Romans 9, several of them, where we talk about that. But I want to I want to focus on this right now. Psalm 5.5, 5, the foolish shall not stand in thy sight. Thou hatest all workers of iniquity. And what we used to point out all the time was that, look, it doesn't say that he hates the iniquity. It says he hates the workers of iniquity. Well, that's very interesting that he hates the people. Now, a Calvinist would say, well, God hates the unelect and the reprobate and loves the elect. Well, you're not going to find that in any Bible you ever found anywhere in any language, any version, any time. Okay, that's not a scriptural thought. Um, that's that's the dualistic thinking that they bring to it. And what we used to say in the independent Baptist realm was that the default position, like John three thirty six, if you're not a believer, you're on, you're under the wrath of God. The wrath of God abides on you. So you're either a believer, you're either under the wrath of God. The love of God is available to everyone, but only through the cross. That's how we would explain this kind of thing away. And we're going to come at this from a little bit of a different angle today, okay? Uh, Psalm 10.3, For the wicked boasteth of his heart's desire, and blesseth the covetous, whom the Lord abhorreth. Now it's connected to their covetousness. Leviticus 20.23, 20, You shall not walk in the manners of the nation nation which I cast out before you, for they committed all these things, and therefore I abhorred them. Not saying I abhorred what they did, but them. Okay, that's what we always used to point out. Where, you know, there would always be something, God, God hates the sin, not the sinner. Well, it sounds like he hates the sinner, if you read these this way. Um, these six things that the Lord hate, yea, seven are an abomination unto him. A proud look, a lying tongue, Hands that shed innocent blood, not the shedding of innocent blood, but the hands that do it. Not the lie, but the, but the tongue that did it. You see, you see, you know, subject verb agreement kind of stuff here. A heart that deviseth wicked imaginations, feet that be swift and running to mischief. A false witness, so the false witness is hated. And he that soweth discord among brethren, so he is hated. He that soweth discord among brethren. So Calvinists are always pointing these out, saying, see, God hates the non-elect. Which, of course, is foolishness. Hosea 9.15, All their wickednesses in Gilgal, for there I hated them. For their wickedness, uh, for the wickedness of their doings, I will drive them out of mine house. I will love them no more. All their princes are revolters. All right. And then Zechariah 11.8, Three shepherds also I cut off in one month, and my soul loathed them, and their soul also abhorred me. I don't know why I know why I have brethren in here because I had a I had a mispaste. And then Matthew 7 23. By the way, today's slideshow, there is a link in the description. If you want today's slideshow, I did post it on Etsy. We're gonna have some charts. We got some fancy charts coming up. They kind of look like this coming soon to a theater near you. Um, and if you want that, you can get it off Etsy. The link is in the description below this entire slideshow that you're looking at today. Uh, is on Etsy right now. You can go get it yourself. Matthew seven twenty three. And then while I profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. And the point that I want to point out here is that 
Um, God, God's hate is always conditioned on iniquity. It's never unconditional or decreed in advance. And then Kayla says, aren't we all workers of iniquity according to the Christian paradigm? And that's where we get ourselves caught in a little pickle. So let's look at what, um, let's look at what Paul says in Romans 7. And again, I, I apologize for this being so small. So what I can do is this. I'm going to duplicate these temporarily just for the sake of making this bigger, right? Oh, I didn't want to do that. <laughs> if that's too small, I'll pipe up and let me know. So now we'll look at verses uh, 1 through 6. Know ye not, brethren, for I speak unto them that know the law, how that the law hath dominion over a man as long as he liveth. For the woman which hath an husband is bound by the law to her husband so long as she, she, he liveth. But the husband, if the husband be dead, she is loose from the law. So then, if while the husband liveth, she be married to another man, she shall be called an adulteress. But if her husband be dead, she is freed from that law so that she is no adulteress, though she be married to another man. Now, the first thing I need to point out here is that this is not about... <laughs> This is not about adult uh, marriage and divorce and remarriage. This, this really has nothing to do with that. He's just giving an example of how something is in the Old Testament law. He's not giving you all the details on it. This is not a verse you should go to for talking about uh, marriage, divorce, remarriage, widowing, rem that kind of stuff. It's not. It's not that kind of verse. It's just. It's just an example. He's just using this to lay the framework of an example that he's about to give. So in, it, in other words, if the husband's dead, the woman can remarry. Wherefore, my brethren, ye are also become dead to the law by the body of Christ, that ye should be married to another, even to him that is raised from the dead, that we should bring forth fruit unto God. Well, if you're dead, if you're the one that died, <laughs> then what part of you is living to, to get married to Christ? You see? Something something is dead and something is alive. And we're going to sort that out. For when we were in the flesh, the motions of sins which were by the law did work in our members to bring forth fruit unto death. Now notice, this is also right after Romans 6.23, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. And if you look at next chapter, Romans 8. 13 or 14 it says if you live after the flesh ye shall die now these are temporal things what do i mean by that if you jump off a tall building you will die if you smoke meth you will get meth mouth okay They're those kinds of things um temporal things but now we are delivered from the law verse 6 that being dead wherein we were held we should serve in the newness of the spirit and not in the oldness of the letter. So you're dead, but there's something that can still serve. So let's see what that is. Now I want to read the next portion to you. So let me um, let me copy this slide again, and <laughs> let's make the font big again. And now we're reading Romans chapter seven, verses seven through fifteen. Okay. What shall we say then? Is the law sin? God forbid. Nay, I had not known sin, but by the law, for I had not known lust, except the law had said, thou shalt not covet. So if the law didn't say, thou shalt not covet, you wouldn't know you were doing something wrong when you coveted. But sin, taking occasion by the commandment, wrought in me all manner of concupiscence, for without the law sin was dead. For I was alive without the law once. Remember that phrase, it's in blue for a reason. But when the commandment came, sin revived and I died. And the commandment which was ordained to life I found to be unto death. For sin, taking occasion by the commandment, deceived me, and by it slew me. Sin. Uh, the... <laughs> Opportunity, taking advantage of an opportunity, an opportunist, sin is.
Aaron asks a question. Why does it matter if God hates the workers of iniquity? What implication does it have if any of our other of any of our other beliefs about God? Uh, I can show you that. If it matters. Why does it matter if God hates the workers of iniquity? What impl- Okay, that's kind of what I'm trying to deal with today. That's a great question, though. So that's what this video is about. What does this mean to me? I'm going to show you what occurred to me. Wherefore, the law is holy and the commandment is holy and just and good. Was then that which was good made death unto me? God forbid, but sin, that it might appear sin working death in me by that which is good, that sin by the commandment might become exceeding sinful. <laughs> now, that's... That's a bunch of words. Paul can get wordy. Now, I have in here this phrase. That is when you realize the double bind. Okay? Jesus says, if you look on a woman to lust after her, you committed adultery already in your heart. What's happening there? That's a double bind. It, and, and it's almost like a Zen Cohen. It's, it's designed to get you to realize that the standard cannot be kept. And so, while our, our legalistic independent Baptist friends and our Pentecostal friends and some of these legalistic types and the hard shell ba- uh, Calvinists and all those, they will double down and they will try to control everything a woman wears. They will try to control, you know, let thine eyes look straight on, let thine eyes look straight before thee. Uh, Job said, I have made a covenant with my eyes. Why then should I look upon a maid? They have all these things about, about, about dirty thoughts and not looking at women and women dressing modestly and all this. All that does is put a whole bunch of nonsense on, on your salience landscape in the way of everything else you should be aiming at. And it is absolute profane disorientation to do that to somebody, to put them in a legalistic environment right there. The point of what Jesus is saying is not to get you to double down to never look at a woman and and have an adult, uh, you know, a quote unquote adulterous thought. Thought that's not the point. The point is to realize that it's a double bind, and that it, it's it's not something that can be done. It's like telling somebody you must love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, and soul. But you can't do it because you were told. You have to do it of your own volition, you know, generatively, sui generously. And like, well, but you've already told me about it, and that's the only way I would know to do that. Otherwise, So it's a double bind. The point is to realize a double bind. And once you start to realize some of the double binds in the Bible, um, if you are too cynical and too uh, nihilistic and cynical you will start to think that the Bible has contradictions in it and you will be tempted to walk away from it and forsake Christianity because the Bible's full of contradictions or full of stupid nonsense that can't be followed, that sort of thing. But on the other hand, if you look at it through the eyes of wisdom, wisdom is justified of her children, you realize that you are being brought to the point of a double bind on purpose, on purpose, so that you can wake up to it and start to develop a point in time when you're going to leave the raft behind you. There's an old saying from the East where after you use the raft to cross the river, leave the raft there, don't keep taking it with you. Or when when the, even the Buddhists would say, Buddha himself would say, okay, after you follow the Eightfold Noble Path, you will get to a point where you realize you don't need it. And that's the point. When the but you had to follow it in order to in order to get to the point where you realized you didn't need it, um, like the like on a space shuttle, they shed their rockets, they shed their booster rockets at a certain point. Well, they needed them to get to that certain height, but then you come to a certain point where you realize you you don't need them anymore and you cannot proceed with them. Okay, so these double bind things, you cannot proceed forward in growth. If you take these double binds as literal legalistic rules and morals to follow, the idea is for you to awaken to the point that you need to transcend them. That's the idea. Okay? So we know that the law is spiritual, but I am carnal, soul under sin. For that which I do, I allow not... 
For what I would, that do I not, but what I hate, that do I. Right? Don't you have a, a habit that you have a tough time kicking? Something like that. I do the things that, you know, I said I was going to get up at 4.30 and exercise this morning, but I didn't. That kind of thing. Could be anything, no matter what it is. And now the rest of the chapter. Let's look at the rest of this. <clears throat> and I'm going to go ahead and delete some of these and then make the font bigger so that it's easier to see. Verse 16, if then I do that which I would not, I consent unto the law that it is good. Now then, listen, listen to me, read the text. It says, now then it is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. Is Paul the one doing the sins? According to that verse, when he messes up, doesn't, you know, do what he says he ought to. Is he the one doing the sin? According to that verse, he's not. And what we're going to start talking about here is all the things that you are not. Paul starts talking about himself duplicitously here in two different ways. And we want to separate those within you so that you can see the difference between your authentic self. So let me ask you another question. Um... For that which I do, I allow not. In other words, he's got rules to not do this thing. Say he's got, you know, say he's addicted to cigarettes. He doesn't. He has a rule against cigarettes, but he keeps smoking them anyway. Something like that. It's against the rules. I don't allow it, but I'm doing it. For what I would, that I do not. I would not not smoke at all, but I'm doing it anyway. But what I hate, that I do. Well. Who's the worker of iniquity here? Is that iniquity? Is he doing iniquity? Um, is it Paul doing the iniquity? According to verse 17. If God hates all the workers of iniquity, does God hate Paul? Because Paul's still working iniquity. Well, not him. No more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. Do you see where I'm going with this? Okay. For I know that in me, that is in my flesh, dwelleth no good thing. For to will is present with me, but how to perform that which is good I find not. Like I keep wanting to kick the cigarette habit, but I just can't quite figure it out. For the good that I would, I do not. But the evil which I would not, that I do. Now Calvinists, a lot of Calvinists that I try to talk to, they try to, they try to put this in Paul's past. You see... You got perseverance of the saints and all that. And so Paul's not sinning on a regular basis. No, that's not what Paul that's not what's going on. Paul is still struggling with the flesh here. Now, if I do that which I would not, listen, here it is again. He says it twice. He just said it in verse 17, and he's about to say it again in verse 20, in case you missed it. Twice. Now, if I do that, which I would not, it is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. So who's doing the iniquity? And if God hates the worker of iniquity, does he hate Paul or the sin that dwells within him? Okay. I find in a law that when I would do good, evil is present with me, for I delight in the law of God after the inward man. So now he's going to start separating this inward man versus the flesh okay now we could the inward man is what we're going to call the authentic self and the flesh is essentially what we're going to call the ego all right <clears throat> yes you are not your thoughts as lolasaurus rex says but i see another law in my members warring against the law of my mind and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin, which is in my members. O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from this body of death, from the body of this death? I thank God through our Lord Jesus Christ, so that with the mind I myself serve the law of God, but with the flesh the law of sin. Now notice Paul has made a distinction here. He's made a, he's made a distinction between himself 
and what his flesh does. And if you've ever done something like cognitive behavioral therapy, you will be taught that you are not your thoughts. You are not your actions. You are this other thing. And what we have here, right here in Romans chapter 7, it's been there for almost 2,000 years, it's right there in the text where we are told to make a distinction between the true you, the real self, versus your actions. You are not your actions. There's something else going on here with, the, with your actions. So I have... <clears throat> I have a uh, list over here on the left. You are not your name. If you ask someone, hey, who are you? What are you here? Oh, I'm Kevin Thompson. You're not. That's not you. You were. Uh, you existed before your name. Some kids aren't named until a couple weeks after they're born, in some cultures especially. Um, sometimes even in the United States. You're not your name. And some people change their name. All right? Some people change their name completely. I know people who have changed their name. You are not your name. That person is still there, but their name changed. You are not your thoughts. You are not your past or your future actions. You are not your emotions. You are not your body. Your body, you know, your cells change. Every seven years, all the cells in your body's body is replaced, what the biologists tell us. You are not your body. You could also lose your arm or your leg and still survive and you'd still be you you didn't lose part of you when you lost that you are not your preferences your desires you are not your beliefs you are not your in-group affiliations you are not your familial affiliations whether biological or otherwise you are not your successes you are not your failures now, the problem is the consciousness that's looking out from behind those eyes does suffer, if you want to use the term suffer, does undergo what we call embodiment in the 4E cognition, which is embodied cognition, embedded, enacted, extended cognition. And then John Verveke adds three more, emotional or effective, affective cognition, exapted cognition, and there's another one, and I don't know what it is. I've heard him say he's got seven. I've only ever heard him give the six. I don't know what the last one is. So if somebody knows it, let me know what that is. But you are, the, the consciousness, your experience of the universe from your own particular center of the universe is embodied in this flesh. And that is... You could think of this body as essentially your VR headset that it, that can be uh, accommodated and accessorized and upgraded and get firmware upgrades from your culture and from other things like that. And that's basically what you are in. And what happens is people, as your body, because your consciousness is embodied, as your body gets cultural firmware upgrades, we start to think that these firmware upgrades are us. These software upgrades, we think that they are us. We think that we are our emotions. We think that we are our preferences. Now, if you talk to a an evangelical Christian, they will, they will talk of eternal life and being born again. And when they are talking about eternal life, what they typically have in mind is all of this kind of stuff. They envision this version of themselves, who this body with the, this name, with these thoughts, with these desires, with these emotions and preferences and affiliations and beliefs, they envision that collection of descriptions that they give their ego to be the thing that will persist in the afterlife and have eternal life. I've got news for you. None of this has eternal life. None of it has eternal life. The real you that has eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord is not any of those things, and none of those things are going to go with you. Just like you can't take your car with you, you can't take your house, you can't take your money, right? Your belongings, your, your cherished items, you can't take those things with you when you die. Guess what? You can't take these things with you either. And that is one of the big problems. I've been saying on this channel for a while now that there's something about salvation that I think we're getting wrong 
and I need to meditate. I need to think about this because I don't know what it is. This is one of the things. This is one of the things that we as evangelicals have gotten very wrong about salvation. We have this idea that all these things are us and that that is what will be saved, that that is what gets saved and preserved and will persist. When you, when you die, none of that stuff's getting saved. None of that stuff's going to heaven. You need to come to terms with that. And the faster you can come to terms with that, the more you can start, the more chance you will have to start to see clearly. So I'm going to give you some practices to do as, as this video goes. But what I really want you to get to is where Paul is here, where he says, it is no more I that do it, but sin that dwell in me. I want you to separate you from your actions, just like Paul did in Romans 7.20. Romans 7, 17. I want you to separate you when you say I and myself. I want you to start thinking of yourself separately than, the thing, than whatever it is that's doing these actions. You are not your actions. And then Paul said, With the mind, I myself serve the law of God, but with the flesh, the law of sin. And like that, like Paul is doing here, I want you to make a distinction between you, the real you versus the flesh. What is the flesh? It's all this stuff that comprises our ego, like this, okay? It's all that stuff. Now... Romans 2.14, I have these passages on here. When the Gentiles which have not the law do by nature the things contained in the law, these having not the law are a law unto themselves. Why am I showing you this? I'm gonna, I want to hit on this up here. I want to hit on verse, where was it? I was alive without the law once. That's what I'm looking for. And I can't find it. There it is. Verse 9, for I was alive without the law once. Paul's talking to his past. I was alive without the law once, but when the commandment came, sin revived and I died. What on earth is going on here? In the book of Nehemiah chapter 8, when they gather everybody together to talk to them and read out of the book of the law and read out of it distinctly and cause people to understand the meaning, <clears throat> Thanks, Shredhead, for the super chat. It says they gathered men, women, and you would think men, women, and children. But no, it says men, women, and those that could understand. Okay. Um, <laughs> in other words, small children can't understand. Maybe old folks who are senile can't understand. And maybe there are people who are um, remedial or impaired cognitively. Um, who cannot understand what, what they call God's special children sometimes. So we're talking about people who can understand what that would mean. And I don't want to get into this whole idea of age of accountability. That's not what I'm trying to get to. But something like that where we have to realize that before somebody can understand the law, excuse me, they don't have the law. And that's these passages here. Because the law worketh wrath, for where no law is, there is no transgression. Okay? For until the law, sin was in the world, but sin is not imputed when there is no law. Okay? Um, in other words, until, until the rules tell you that, tell the two-year-old to stop screaming, he doesn't know that he's supposed to stop screaming. <laughs> And it's interesting to me in Romans 2.14 that even the Gentiles, which have not the law, speaking of the law of Moses, they do by nature the things contained in the law. Now, what we have today is a bunch of people running around talking about having a sin nature. Well, the phrase sin nature is not in the Bible, but 
when it talks about the nature of the Gentiles which don't have the law, it says they do the things contained in the law. It does not sound like total depravity to me. These having not the law are a law unto themselves. So I just wanted to make that salient to you. Now, John, I'm going to have to make this bigger because I... <laughs> I have to compare something for you. So I'm going to make this bigger, and I, I had to put this all on one slide. In Romans 7, 14 and 15, we see that Paul is doing all these things that he doesn't want to do. We've already covered this. It's already very clear. We know that the law is spiritual, but I am carnal, sold under sin. For that which I do, I'd allow not. That which I would, that I do. That which I hate, that I do. That kind of thing. So we already covered that. What does John say about that? Look how John words it. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we, this is 1 John 1, 8 and 10. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. Paul and John are both very clearly admitting that sin is present with us, and we would be lying if we said we had no sin. But look what he says next. In Romans seven seventeen. he says, Now then, it is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. Romans seven twenty. Now, if I do that, I would not. It is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. So what does John say about this? He says that he that committeth sin is of the devil. Well, is it Paul doing it? He says it's no more I that do it. He that committeth sin is of the devil, for the devil sinneth from the beginning. For this purpose the Son of God was manifested, that he might destroy the works of the devil. Very interesting. Next thing. Whosoever is born of God doth not commit sin. What's going on here? He just said up here, if we have not sinned, if we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. But then down here he says, whosoever is born of God doth not commit sin. Why? For his seed remaineth in him and he cannot sin because he is born of God. Paul says it this way. It is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. Can Paul sin? Well, you're going to see somebody in that body commit sins. But can he sin? According to John, he can't. And according to Paul, it's no more him doing it. You understand the difference there? Now look what John goes on to say next. He says, In this the children of God are manifest, and the children of the devil. Now here's the qualifier. How, how do we know whether or not somebody is born of God? Whosoever doth not righteousness is not of God. Now, whenever you read that before, I'll bet you were thinking of other people, weren't you? You were thinking of other people instead of the dividing line between good and evil cuts through the heart of every human being. Whoever is committing the sin that you commit is not of God. Are you tracking with me? Are you following me? Are you with me? In this the children of God is manifest, and the children of the devil. Whosoever doth not righteousness is not of God. He that loveth not his brother, neither he that loveth not his brother. So what's the test here? Doing righteousness and loving, loving your brother. For this is the message that ye have heard from the beginning, that we should love one another. So there, here we have a love going on as the indicator of that which is born of God. And we have, whosoever doth not righteousness is not of God. Who doth not righteousness? Well, it's no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me, according to Paul. And then he talks about, neither he that loveth not his brother. So love is the key factor of someone who, you might say, is awakened you say, what do you mean awakened, Kevin? Are you some kind of Eastern person? No, I'm just reading my Bible. Wherefore he saith, Awake thou that sleepest, arise from the dead, and Christ shall give thee light. If you're awakened to what you might call second-tier consciousness, 
or second half of life wisdom or what Fowler would put stages you know, around five or so in Fowler's model, something like that. Um, the key sign of that is an, is an expanding love. It's an expanding and, and growing love that continues to grow and expand. Now, how does Paul say the same thing? Okay, now this is later on, but Paul says something very similar. He connects all this to love. He says, oh, no man, anything but to love one another. This is Romans 13, same book. But to love one another, for he that loveth another hath fulfilled the law. Love is the sign. What did he just get through saying in Romans chapter 12? He said, be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. Well, as you are transformed and as you renew that mind, guess what? You're going to fulfill the law through love, not through ethical, moral rule keeping. Okay. For this thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not bear false witness, thou shalt not covet. If there be any other commandment, it is briefly comprehended in this saying, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. If you love somebody, you're not going to do those things. You're not going to steal their stuff. You're not going to kill them. You're not going to lie about them. You're not going to covet their stuff if you love them. So both of these fools, just kidding. That's the way me and Paula talk about people sometimes. Both of these apostles here talk about the relationship with sin and the impossibility of the true self to be the one doing the sinning and how the the indicator of being in the true self is love um i think paul also says in colossians that uh charity is the bond of perfection and not perfection like sinlessness but perfection like fully mature fully wise All right. So now I'm going to show you this chart, but I'm going to start off simple. I know that looks complicated, but I'm going to start off simple. And the first thing I want to start with is something like this. Sin is missing the mark. All right. And if you were Paul and you are having a difficult time, let's see here, because you're doing things that you don't want to do, if you're living in the flesh, in that false self, in the ego, you are not being your authentic self. One of your goals is to, is to be your authentic self to the greatest degree that you can be your authentic self. And there's a problem with this. And I'm going to try to explain this problem to you. right? And I'm going to show you how Paul talks. And then I'm going to show you a, a, a diagram in tandem that shows how it would a apply to us okay now sin is missing the mark well that would beg the question what is the mark and the mark would be to be virtuous you would need to be your authentic self you need to be your authentic self if you catch a child dancing and it's wonderful and beautiful and graceful but they don't know you're watching. And then you ask, oh, that was just lovely and wonderful. Why don't you do that for us again? It will be different this time. Because this, the attention and the request change the degree of authenticity so that it's no longer coming from the real person. So as we get enculturated, after you're born, you start getting software downloads. You start getting told how to behave, when to behave, what to say, where to say. Say please and thank you. Don't speak out of turn. Say excuse me if you need to say something. Um, you get all these rules of etiquette and what's acceptable and what's not acceptable drilled into you as you get enculturated. Now, <laughs> It seems like everyone's trying to rework the Rubik's Cube on this. Like, well, we need to do it a different way. But here's the deal. Any kind of enculturation that you get from any culture is going to build all of this. All The, the person, the external interface person that you present, your, your press secretary, your ego, gets built by this enculturation. 
Okay, the things that you learn, the things that you know, your education, the things that you do, your habits. It gets built by all of this stuff. Okay, and you you lose that virtue that of when I say virtue, I'm not talking about rule following. I'm talking about that genuine authenticity that a child had dancing when they didn't know anybody was watching, and it didn't even occur to them that they were dancing at all. Okay. Thanks for the super chat, Kayla. She says she got to run. This is my church. Glad to see you all again. Hope everyone had a good Christmas. Thanks for coming back, Kevin. Thanks, Kayla. I really appreciate that. So one of the difficulties we've ha- we have is you need to be enculturated so that you can have a user interface, but later you need to overcome your enculturation so that you can get back to the virtue of your authentic self which you had all along, but you have to refine it, <laughs> okay? So sin is missing the mark of that authentic self. It's that child who now they're told to dance while everyone's watching and it doesn't go like the first time. You miss the mark. You didn't. It's not authentic like it was the first time. <coughs> so what do you do now? You try to get back to that authentic self. What is that authentic self? That's the next slide. Paul said, for I was alive once without the law once, but when the commandments came, sin revived and I died. The enculturation causes your authentic self to be subdued behind your ego to where you don't even know who you are. I think if you ever watch the movie Anger Management, um, they make a big deal out about this. It's got Adam Sandler and... uh, Jack Nicholson in it, and Jack Nicholson is asking him, who are you? And he keeps giving him his name, things like this. And he's like, and he, no, you're not your name. Well, I'd work at, you're not your job. <laughs> None of these things. None of these things are you. And, and it, it frustrates him, and he doesn't know how to answer the question. And you got to get there. I would encourage you to watch that movie just for that sake. So what happens next? You are your authentic self when you are born. And then enculturation starts happening. Now I'm going to show two lines over here. Over here on the right hand side, I'm going to show what our enculturation looks like. Over here on the left hand side, I'm going to give you how Paul sums his up. Okay. Now you have to see it that way in order to get what I'm going to show you. So what does that enculturation look like? Now notice this is the false self. This enculturation builds up the false self. And, and thanks for the super chat, uh, Seraphim. He says, the mark is actually an infinitely receding point of theosis, which we will pursue forever and ever through epictasis. So <clears throat> that's like an, <clears throat> excuse me. It's like what we would call asthmatotic, asthmatote, like where you have, Two graph lines that <clears throat> seem to get closer and closer and closer and closer and closer and closer, but never quite get there, but you keep getting closer and closer and closer. <clears throat> so I, I appreciate that comment in the super chat. So this is going to build your false ego and build your false self. Now the problem, the problem with this is when I say ego, I'm not necessarily saying conceitedness or arrogance. I'm not necessarily saying that. I'm saying confusion about what and who you are. And when you talk about yourself, you're talking you're talking about all this stuff over here rather than you. You are in the ego. You are egoic. Now, what does Paul's look like? And in our religious education, we are taught humility is good and pride is bad. But here's the problem. We identify our ego, we identify ourselves and form our ego by becoming attached to following that moral rule. And that becomes our ego that must be shattered in order for us to transcend it. So you have like, I think Thomas Keating said that growth and transformation is essentially a a series of humiliations. (laughs) And you could also say a series of ego deaths or sufferings that lead you to something else. 
And that separateness, ego is just the false belief that you are separate from God. Doesn't the Bible say that all things are upheld by the word of his power? In him we live, move, breathe, and have our being. And one of the great mysteries in Colossians 1, 26 is Christ in you, the hope of glory. You have to realize that. You have to realize that that's the case. Of Christ, Ephesians 1, 23, who filleth all in all. Is that so or is it not so? You have to realize that. And so one of the things I notice when I go to churches these days, and I can get something out of just about any church service, but I notice that it stands out to me when people start talking about God as this separate other thing that they have to go seeking after. They don't realize that Christ in you, the hope of glory, has been right there the whole time. They don't realize that. In him we live, move, breathe, and have our being. Though he, you know, Happily they might seek after him, though he be not far from every one of us. He's right there. So to, that, that separateness and that ego. And it is when you're in a church service and there's people you know, singing these praise songs and they're lifting up and they're singing to God like God is up in the sky or something. Like there's, a, like there's an old man with a beard up there making a bunch of decisions and calculations and you have to appeal to him. It doesn't work that way. That is not God. That is a false model of God. And when people do, do that, they are conducting idolatry. And they have allowed the world to tell them how to do religion. And when you have a statement of faith and systematic theology, and you see God is this separate thing, you have allowed the world, the secular world, to tell you how to do church and how to do Christianity. When it, We shouldn't be letting the world tell us how to do that. So that is the, the way... The after the Enlightenment and the Renaissance, everyone wants to codify everything and make it explicit. Alfred North Whitehead didn't believe that anything that is really real could actually be made explicit. It is profane to think that something real can be made explicit. All you can do is interface with it through participation and experience. You can have a series of interfaces with it, but you can't make it explicit. In other words, you can't write it all down and have it all figured out. And the idea that you can do that is profane idolatry and it is worldliness to the nth degree. Complete disorientation. Complete disorientation. And so this enculturation builds up your false self and false ego. And one of the most deceptive things about this for religious people is that because you are following all these religious goals, you don't realize that that is your ego. That is what you are attached to. That is... That is what you have built up as your false self, which must be torn down. That's why some people who are following all the religious rules, they can never really have a close relationship with God, if you want to say it that way, until after they really foul up somehow. They go get divorced or have an affair, something that lets them, they have to have something that shatters their mental image that they are following the shatters the affiliate the alignment that they think they have with the set of moral rules and the code of conduct has to shatter that in order for them to have an ego death so that they can finally grow up and start to find their authentic self and find god which you could say is one in the same pursuit what does paul's enculturation look like his was built up like this, okay? <clears throat> it looked like Charlton Heston. That's what Paul's ego death looked like, <laughs> okay? Over in Philippians chapter 3, Paul says, <clears throat> For we are the circumcision which worship God, in the spirit and rejoice in Christ Jesus and have no confidence in the flesh, or you could say no confidence in the ego. And the spirit would be the authentic self. I might also have confidence in the flesh. If any other, like in other words, hey, I got quite an impressive ego myself. If I wanted to, if we were touting egos here, look what I got. That's what Paul would be saying here. It's another way he would say that. That he had whereof he might trust in the flesh or trust in the ego. If you want to tout your ego around like somebody like James White or J.D. Martin does. Um, I more circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel, the tribe of Benjamin, of the Hebrew of Hebrews, touching the law of Pharisee, 
concerning zeal, persecuting the church, touching the righteousness which is in the law, blameless. What is all that? That's his ego. What is all that? That is nothing. That is not him. That is his, that is his this stuff. That's what that is. It is not him. And he knows that. And that's what he's saying. How do I know that's what he's saying? But th- what things were gained to me, those I counted loss for Christ, the genuine. Doubtless I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ my Lord, for whom I have suffered loss of all things to do count them but dung that I may win Christ. This dude has had an ego death. Right? If I was in Galatians chapter 2, verse 20, Paul would say, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. So there's this duality going on here where you recognize that your, your ego, this all this stuff that you had built up, is crucified, it is dead, this is not what gets eternal life. The fact that Paul was a Pharisee, circumcised the eighth day, tribe of Benjamin, all that stuff, he does, none of that gets eternal life. None of it gets eternal life. And the fact that he was an apostle and started a bunch of churches, whatever, what's, none of that gets eternal life either. So Paul's looks like this. His false self-ego is built up in his religion, Philippians chapter 3. And Paul even says, But before faith came, we were kept under the law, shut up unto faith, which should afterward be revealed. Maybe it's a little easier to see if I make it bigger. Wherefore, the law was our schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ, that we might be justified by faith. But after that faith has come, we are no longer under a schoolmaster. Now, what you might lose in the translation here, not just the translation, but what you might lose in the presentation here, is that it is not just the law that serves in that capacity. Um, Richard Rohr talks about first half of life wisdom. And in the first half of life wisdom, you have a container, and he calls it a container. And it could be your denomination, your affiliation with something, could be a marriage, something around which you construct your ego, basically. Okay? And for religious people, it's going to be this container thing. And that's so that's the container. So the idea is that whatever container you have chosen, that Thing is designed so that you reach the end of it and realize the double bind that it is and then realize you can leave the raft on the side of the river and then go on to perfection. That's the whole point of any container. Paul just happens to be talking about this one, his. And in the context of the book of Galatians, their problem was thinking that they had to follow the Old Testament law. So, Another way to say that would be like, look, the law was, that's just the container that we built our first half of life wisdom with so that we could realize the double bind that it was and escape from it and leave that raft behind and no longer be under that schoolmaster. So no matter what that container is, it might be Calvinism, it might be provisionism, it might be mid-Acts dispensationalism, it might be Acts 2 dispensationalism, doesn't matter. No matter what that container is, that's first half of life wisdom stuff, and you are supposed to have an ego death to move beyond it. So it doesn't matter what it is. So what does ours look like? What does ours look like? Ours looks something like this. We have this culture thing. Everything in your culture, you have your values, your greater community, your knowledge and stories, your language that you share or language is. You have traditions and rituals and your values. That's probably where your religious area fits into you and your culture. 
techniques and skills, tools and objects, the arts, food and drink, and there's probably a lot of other things that could be in there, but this is good enough for our purposes. So what happens to you is you get enculturated like that. Paul got enculturated like this. Your schoolmaster to bring you to Christ looks more like this. And you have to realize that your understanding of the law and these passages and all that stuff is really nested in all of your enculturation and, a, and your ego attachment and identity with all of your enculturation. And when you look at scripture, you're seeing it through all that and you're mapping that onto what you're seeing and it's limiting what you can see. And we don't realize that's happening sometimes. So what it looks like for Paul and what it looks like for us is like this. So here's Paul's specific first half of life wisdom container. And here is our more general first half of life wisdom container. But you might be, you might have grown up in a Seventh-day Adventist household or in a Mormon household or in a Baptist household or as a Jew or a Messianic Jew or a Muslim. It doesn't matter what you grew up as. Whatever that is, it is a it is a container that is designed for you to get to the point where you realize that just like rules on a toddler, there is there is a time to leave them behind, then start walking in wisdom rather than in rules. Okay. So I have this. Notice I have the authentic self here. I have it in gray now because the authentic self has become subdued when the enculturation happens. And now you are being programmed. You could say brainwashed, but the problem is you need enculturation in order to function. And then you have to figure out what parts of it you need to undo so that you can get back to your authentic self. And that, you know, when, when people say, well, it's child abuse to raise a kid in this particular way or to make them believe in God or teach them this particular thing, there's, there's, there's really no way that you can train a child to interface with society and culture without them building this enculturation and subduing the authentic self that I know of, all right? And everyone having all these ideas of what you should and shouldn't do, really what I think they're all getting at is we're trying to find ways not to subdue the authentic self so much, which is a good thing to try to aim for. I'm all for that, okay? But what happens is the people who are most gung-ho about particular ways of doing that create their own kind of fundamentalism with the rigidity of those legalistic type rules that are being applied. But if we could have some kind of enculturation that does a better job of maintaining the authentic self rather than subduing it, we kind of need to figure that out. We need the, the future of mankind, if we don't all kill ourselves, we'll have to figure that out. We have to figure that out. And that's one of the things that I would like to experiment with in FSI, with Beyond the Fundamentals, is how, and I know like, not just experiment on kids is not what I'm saying, but like to try to change the culture of how we think about cultivating insight and wisdom within people in general, All right? Not just scaling a bunch of beliefs and teaching it to them, but actually figuring out how to cultivate, how to draw out that, that wisdom that is latent within their authentic self that's already in there. How do I draw that out without subduing it, All right? Because by time, because there's, imagine, imagine when you're born, you have the wisdom of Yoda, and your enculturation, just like Yoda, Mr. Miyagi, whatever figure you want to say, okay? Your enculturation suppresses all that, all right? And so over in the East, they know that. And so when you go to a, a Zen Buddhist guru, what they try to do, what they're trying to do, they're not trying to teach you new beliefs. They're trying to break through all that enculturation and all the things that you're attached to to find that Yoda and Mr. Miyagi wisdom that's been in there the whole time, and draw, find a way to draw it out. Find a way to get that, the way a child dances when nobody's looking, to find a way to draw that back out of them and stop it from being suppressed by all their religious beliefs, by their Calvinism, by all this and that, you know? It's like, you can imagine, 
Imagine that inside James White's person, his genuine person, which likely nobody will ever meet, there is all kinds of wisdom in there, which is so battened down by Calvinism and rivalry that it will never be seen. It will never be drawn out. It will never be gotten to. It has to be chipped away and broken away. <clears throat> so the authentic self becomes nearly completely subdued by the identity that is mediated, created and mediated to interface with society within this culture. You know, did, um, <laughs> this identity is not the authentic self. My dad teaches me, he taught me a work ethic. You want to be to work on time. You want to get up early, be there 15 minutes early, do everything they ask you and do a little bit more. Stay late if you can. When you shake somebody's hand, stand up, have a firm handshake. When, a, when an adult or the boss or a lady comes into the room, you stand up. I mean, there's things like this, okay? Anything wrong with any of that? No. But when you start attaching your ego to how well you do it, you become attached to those things, Okay. Your capacity to find your authentic self lies beyond the shattering of that. And that's what we have to figure out in the enculturation piece is how do we understand that those things aren't the real us so that there maybe doesn't have to be shattering. They teach you that you have nothing to learn. That's exactly right. And once you realize that the thing that can be said is not the thing, so what happens here is um, something happens in the middle. While, while this container is being built, something happens. And in spiral dynamics, in this chart, somewhere right around here, you're going to possibly start waking up and getting into second tier consciousness. And this chart is upside down, goes the other way. Remember, these are in the slides that are on Etsy. Or you can Google spiral dynamics charts. You can do that too. Or I think I googled spiral dynamics first, first tier wisdom, something like that. First tier consciousness, second tier consciousness, that kind of thing. Got these little charts and, and you can read these and study them. They're, they're very interesting. But something happens while you're in the middle of your enculturation. Hopefully if you're on schedule somewhere between the ages of say 30 and 40, somewhere around there. Um, I, I barely got in. Mine started right around 39 with inklings happening before then, but nothing I could put my thumb on really. And then, so I'm going to represent that when you cross into that next tier of consciousness, I'm going to represent that with this little red line right here. And before the red line, notice over here on the right, I have a little Pinocchio up until then. Up until, as long as you're first stage consciousness, you are a wooden Pinocchio, you're not a real boy. We're going to call that first tier consciousness. And a lot of people spend their entire lives in first tier consciousness and never come out. And that's not good or bad, it just is what it is. And if the only way you could value it as good or bad is if you realize that getting into second tier consciousness will enable you to be more uh, loving and helpful to a wider array of people, including yourself. And so in second tier consciousness, you have an increased capacity for good um, with the same amount of sincerity, you might say. Okay. Over here, uh, on the way to becoming a real boy, I have ego death with an S and apostrophe because you might have several ego deaths that take us, that take you into uh, second tier consciousness. Now, what else happens in second tier consciousness? I have these two things down here. I have your false self and your authentic self both continue to go forward. I'm going to make this bigger so you can see this passage to the best degree possible. And maybe I should make another slide with this passage on there so you can see it better but understand that understand that that's where it is right there here we go i do this all the time when i'm making these slides what did jesus say in matthew oh. 
make this bigger here. He said, Nay, lest while ye gather up the tares, the root also, you root up also the wheat with them, but let both grow together until the harvest. And in the time of harvest, I will say to the reapers, Gather ye together first the tares, and bind them in bundles to burn them, but gather the wheat into my barn. Well, guess what's going to happen? These tares <laughs> are going to be gathered up and burned. Like 1 Corinthians chapter 3, whoever buildeth on these, wood, hay, or stubble, precious stones, it's going to be tried by fire. We're going to figure out what it is. All this stuff is burning up. It is all burning up. So you've got to figure out a way to um, actually come through your authentic self. So this passage here, where you have the wheat and the tares going together, that is the passage that I have between these two arrows. Okay, I have the tares over here, that's your false self. And I have the wheat over here, that's your authentic self. So now for the rest of your life, you have what Paul has. It is no longer I that do it, but you know the flesh. I myself, with my mind, serve the law of God, but with my flesh, serve the law of sin and death. That will exist for the rest of your life. You can't get rid of your ego because you still have to interface with society. And I'm going to explain some more of that using some analogies like with computer input-output devices. Your ego is essentially your input-output device for interfacing with you, for mediating society and communities. And you have to have an ego self in order to interface on this planet. You just, but <clears throat> what we need you to do is realize that that's not you. So these other arrows that I have here is where you regain and re-emerge the authentic self coming out of realizing that your enculturation is a double bind, going into second tier consciousness, suffering some ego deaths, uh, becoming a real boy, finding your authentic self, realizing Christ in you, the hope of glory. So now your authentic self with functional but not domineering societal interface. So your ego is still there functioning. So you interface with the rest of society, but it is not domineering and you don't have it confused for who you really are. And then I have over here, now we're hitting the mark. We are our authentic selves and we've become a real boy. Pinocchio has turned into a real boy in Job 23, 10, but he knoweth the way that I take, but when he hath tried me, I shall come forth as gold. So these ego deaths is going to be suffering and pain. Jordan Peterson recently spoke in Ephesus and I watched the, uh, the video of it and I thought it was a very good video and it's, it's standard Jordan Peterson stuff, but he's got such a way of wording things. It's just amazing to listen to sometimes. <clears throat> he said, and this, you tie all this together with how Fowler says, Usually it's some crisis mediation that causes growth into the next, next stage. And Richard Rohr says great love and great suffering are necessary for transformation. And uh, Ian McGilchrist and John Verveke talk about, you know, this some kind of great suffering that a person undergoes which provokes transformation. And then, you know, you know all that. And Jordan Peterson had a great way of wording it. He said, maybe pain is the only thing that's like really real. The only thing that you really know is really real is pain. And the only reason you grow, and, I, and I'm inferring here from this, the only reason you grow, you, you can't grow until you've experienced pain, is because since pain is the most real thing, the only thing that you can learn at that point is whatever will ameliorate the pain or make it acceptable and and that is the only thing that is more real than the pain and so it is really only after encountering pain experientially participatorily that you start to build up who you're really going to become by how you deal with that i thought that was very interesting <clears throat> Um, yeah, Seraphim says, awesome slides. I appreciate that. And these are available 
on Etsy for anybody who wants them. So what I'm going to do in the next slide is I'm going to separate out Paul's journey over here because these are these there's not I'm not trying to show you two different tracks. What I'm trying to show you is Paul's specific acculturation had Charlton Heston in it, and our specific acculturation has Christian Bale in it. You know, it's it's different. It's different, but it's the same. You have a different container. Everybody's got a slightly different container for their first half of life wisdom. And they have to break out of it. So if I were to separate that out and just show you what our journey looks like, it would be something like this. Okay? And what I've added, I've taken out Paul's particular journey. And so here's our enculturation. Here's what that looks like. And then we have that dividing line where we cross into second tier consciousness. And then we regain and reemerge the authentic self, ideally after that, and you have the wheat and the tares growing together. And all these things, your, all this stuff, your enculturation builds up your ego around your name, your thoughts, your actions, your emotions, your body, your preferences, your desires, your beliefs, your in-group affiliations, your familiar, familial affiliations, your successes and your failures. And all that stuff needs to stay back there with wooden Pinocchio, with puppet Pinocchio. That is not you. That is not what has eternal life. That's not what's moving forward. So if I were to take away everything bad, you could say that this, see what I did there? This is the part of you that has eternal life in Christ. This is the part of you that does not have eternal life in Christ, that will not persist when your body stops working. They say that uh, your bed is a shelf for your body when you're not using it. Well, one day you're going to be put to bed with a shovel. And guess what? All this stuff right there, it is gone when you get put to bed with a shovel. It's gone. And what persists is that authentic self. When he hath tried me, I shall come forth as gold. <clears throat> People are arguing about who Moses is now. That's pretty funny. All right. I hope you're following all these charts. So as a quick review, the full chart looks like this. And we've gone through step by step to see what happens and how this ego gets formed and how it needs to be dealt with. And our chart looks like this, how it needs to be dealt with. Okay. Okay. So this is what gets eternal life. This is not what gets eternal life. And you need to understand the difference between those two. And, and now, now we're going to go forward and talk about some other things. Your false self, your ego, or your false self is just an input-output device. It is not the computer. It is not the processor. I think it's funny when you watch those movies where somebody's doing something under the radar on a computer and they don't want the cops or the FBI to find out. And then when they get caught... It shows them taking sledgehammers and bashing in the monitor. That doesn't do anything, okay? You have to destroy the CPU. You have to destroy the hard drive. You have to destroy the RAM. You have to destroy the GPU, which sometimes has RAM embedded in it. You have to destroy all that stuff. Somebody says, is it gone or is it redeemed? Okay? Um, the part of you that is redeemed is not those mutable things. Um, so you might think that like here, here's, here's my keyboard and my, and my mouse, right? That is not the computer. The monitor that I'm looking at here is not the computer. I could destroy all these and the computer would be just fine. That's just your user interface and your ego is like a, is, is like IO devices, input output devices that help you mediate with the computer. The, the keyboard, the compute, the keyboard, the monitor, and the mouse. And what's really going on, ones and zeros being transmitted across wires and transistors in the back of the machine, you can't interface with that, at least not very efficiently. You might know how, but it doesn't help you type an email very fast. You need, you need these little icons and windows, and all this user interface stuff is very useful, okay? And your ego is kind of like that. Your ego... But, 
if you don't understand anything about computers, you know that all these little icons I'm looking at on my computer screens right now, that's not really what's happening on the computer itself. It's just a bunch of ones and zeros, but they're being represented in this, in this way so that I can interface with them, okay? So your ego can be brought into conformity with your authentic self so that you can use it to interface with people and with society, with your job. And you could, for, so over here on the right hand side, I have this example like your authentic self. It, all these devices that interface with the cloud, those are not the authentic self. The, the real deal is going on in the cloud. And so you are kind of like that. And I have this one as well. Imagine these are all thin clients and up there the authentic self is in the cloud and all these thin clients, they're just accessing the data that's in the cloud. Something like that. Your ego is a thin client that has access to your authentic self, but people just use it to play games, <laughs> play in solitaire all the time instead of actually using their thin client to access what's real, the real deal. Okay, so we looked at this already, how Paul, and I have it here in my slides, just to mention it again, Paul says it's not him that's doing these things. In other words, it's his ego, it's his flesh. John said, whosoever is born of God doth not commit sin. When you arise from the dead and Christ shall give thee light, right? Right? You realize that it's not the real you, that's you're not your actions. All right? So you could go through and separate all these things. It is it is this part of Paul that's doing the sin. It is not this part of Paul that's doing the sin. Tracking? It is impossible, John says, for he that is born of God to commit sin. This cannot commit sin. This can. One of them is you. One of them is not. Ephesians 4, 17. So what we need to do is the phrase I want to point out here is put on and put off. Okay. That you put off concerning the former conversation. So what do we need to do with that? We need to put off one, the old man. Right. Right which is corrupt according to the deceitful lusts. That's your ego. That's all the things that you're not. And be renewed in the spirit of your mind and that ye put on the new man. All right? Start acting in that inner man self, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. What? Which after what? Bam. After God. The, the part of you that's in the image of God is that part. And it is in you. That new man is in you. That inner man. It's actually older than your ego. But it's um, it's new to you because you don't rediscover it until after you enter second tier consciousness. And start breaking through and stop being a puppet Pinocchio. And I'm going to add a little sentence to this. Which would be to... See the witness in others. See an interface. I'm going to read these in a second. So what are some practices and perspectives that you can do to help separate you? How do you put off the former conversation? And how do you be renewed in the spirit of your mind? How do you put on the new man? And there's some quick little things that you can do. Um, you can practice seeing yourself in observation mode as an outside observer. You become what some might call the watcher. Now, you can do this in a very concentrated way when you meditate. Like when you meditate, be still and know that I am God. One of the things when you want to be still is you want to find a way to actually keep your mind still. Be still. Be completely still. Okay? Really be still. Like the... Uh, prayers that the Holy Spirit makes for us, which cannot be uttered. You want to be completely still. And all the things that are popping up, all the thoughts that are trying to go through your head, you have to realize that they are not you. And you can identify them and say, oh, instead of saying, look at my thoughts, 
or thinking that the thoughts are you, you could say something like, oh, look at the, look at the silly thoughts that this guy is having. All right, these are the kind of thoughts this, this person sees or that my ego sees. And then you, you, uh, some people say you identify it and then imagine that it's on a boat on a river and you, you just let it go. You just let that thought go and you realize that it's not you. That's a thought that occurred. It is not you. So you practice, and this takes practice, to allow these things to go and realize that they are not you. And eventually you want to discipline yourself so that you can have a clear mind and actually be still and know that I am God. Okay. So you can start off concentrating with this on meditation. And actually the verse, be still and know that I am God, is a great verse to meditate on when you do that. But then you also want to start expanding this out into your daily activities to where, oh, I didn't realize that I did this all the time. You start to realize things that you are doing as if you're observing somebody else do them. And start to see yourself, the, your actions as an other. And you have to know that this takes time and practice to really get this. And the next thing you want to do is you want to be the bigger, be the bigger background separate from what you observe. Um, they say if you put a teaspoon of water and a teaspoon of salt in a cup of water, it will be too salty to drink. But if you put a teaspoon of salt in a pond, it will barely make a difference overall. The idea is to be the pond. Great peace have they which love thy law and nothing shall offend them. You want to ask yourself, is anything offending me? And if anything is offending you, you know, if something is salty, causing you to be bitter, causing you to be salty, stop being the cup of water and start being the pond. Start, start being bigger. Start being, having that bird's eye view and envisioning um, that you have some sort of responsibility for the overall well-being of everything in your general geographic area that's going on, something like that, to help you realize how small and petty whatever's happening to your ego at that moment is and how much it really doesn't matter. Also, you want to expand out, instead of just spatially, you want to expand out in time. Look up into the future, look up into the past, and expand out in time and be all of that as well and realize um, that those things... Realize the bigger perspective and how these little things in the bigger perspective really you should not get all wrapped around the axle about, about them. You know, great peace have they which love thy law and nothing shall offend them. I meditate on that verse. Strive to maintain. Then the third thing you want to do is strive to maintain this perspective in all your interactions and be. Be. What do you mean be? Be. Wherever you be in the now, be be present wherever you are right then. Uh, Jehovah said, "I am that I am," and it's like you know it could be translated, "I will be that I will be." It's like a it's like an invitation to be the co-creator. We like like in Jordan Peterson's lecture, he said, "We are each." I'm putting this in my own words, more or less a tendril of the logos, and we have that creative power to speak truth in love and create habitable order out of chaos. And to, to see the potential and bring it into reality, we have that capacity, and we have a creation. We have an invitation from our Creator to be along with Him. All right. And so, as you realize that you are not your actions, you are not all of those things. Whenever you interface with other people, part of this perspective is to try to, as best as you can interface with that part of them to the degree that you can and see them as that part of them and realize how much ego you're dealing with when you're talking to somebody versus how much authentic self is in there. And now I'm going to swip, swap over to something else. Now, we're going to deal with our third thing, which is our understanding of God. So what have we dealt with so far? We divided this into three things. Does God hate some people? We dealt with that in the beginning. And then we have spent all the time since then talking about the outer man versus the inner man based on Romans 7. And the idea is that it's no longer I that do it, 
but sin that dwelleth in me, that do those evil things. And so we talked about the ego versus the authentic self. The next, the third tier of things that I want to bring into this is under our understanding of God, okay? Future sowing and reaping and future self. Now, what I want to get away from is I want you to get away from having any static model of God. Do not have, do not think that any set of explicit statements can capture God and that you can have God figured out any more than you could figure out your spouse with a few sets of explicit statements. That would be disrespectful, okay? It would be disrespectful. And when we do that to God, we are creating an idol and we are worshiping that instead of God. In order to really worship God the best of your ability, to the degree that you can, you kind of need to keep yourself guessing about what God is. or, Or another way to say that is don't settle on any one particular model of God. We, we kind of have this, huh, culturally, we have this like Monty Python version of God, this old man with a long beard sitting up on a cloud somewhere, making all these decisions and interacting with his creator in kind of the way that in the Greek mythology, you know, Zeus might do. And that's not the image that we get from scripture. And what I want to do is... is I want you to keep rotating that model and entertain a variety, an ecology of models of God so that we don't become idolatrous and make explicit that which cannot be made explicit, which is the highest, the highest form of profanity that we can do is to try to make explicit that which cannot be made explicit. So when we look at our view of God, when we're in our third tier over here, um, our understanding of God, I want to start with Galatians 6, 7, and I want to point out some things that have the same attributes as God. And Galatians 6, 7 says, Be not deceived, God is not mocked, for whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. For he that soweth to his flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption. So if you sow to your ego. But he that soweth to the Spirit, your authentic self, shall of the Spirit reap life everlasting. Let us not be weary in well-doing. So if I were to ask you here, what is the uh, formula for life everlasting as we find it here? What would you say? Don't go to your doctrine. Don't go to what you think is right. Don't go to what would make Brother Melms happy or the church happy or the the Baptist that you came from. Don't, Don't worry about what they would think. Think about what this verse says. What is the formula for life everlasting in this passage? I didn't write this, by the way. Somebody did a hit piece on me that I just saw today where they're accusing me of being a a lordship salvation, works salvation Calvinist. (laughs) My wife and I got quite a laugh out of that. And let us not be weary in well-doing, for in due season we shall reap if we faint not. Kind of brings us to this whole idea of salvation. So I like to think of salvation as a fractal thing. We we treat salvation like it's an escape plan from planet Earth, but what we don't realize is that salvation in Christ is it means that every second, every thing, every situation is salvageable in Jesus Christ. It's not just an escape plan for the afterlife. It is it is a here and now thing that we have access to all the time. Through Christ, we can bring salvation to so many scenarios. We... Christ in you, in, you know, Jesus even said, you, should, you shall do even greater works than these. Well, who's doing that? When are you going to start? <laughs> let's have it. Let's do it. Let's believe that. And let's do it. And I'm not talking about miracles and gimmicks and things like that. I'm talking about going into your second tier, second tier consciousness 
so that you have so that your sincerity i'm sure you are sincere but so that that sincerity can have a higher capacity and generativeness of love and transformative capability for yourself and for everyone else around you you can make so many things around you better when you transform into a higher capacity of love so if you were to expand this is called the law of sowing and reaping this verse is the law of sowing and reaping and hosea says if you they sow the wind they shall weep the whirlwind all right now if you were to expand on the law of sowing and reaping ad infinitum i think a guy named alfred north whitehead has done this okay in his book process and reality and his entire it sometimes it's called process thought sometimes it's called process theology sometimes it's called process philosophy doesn't matter what you call it but essentially what's going on with what alfred north whitehead has done is he has essentially taken the motion component of sowing and reaping and he's expanded it all out and it's amazing and i highly recommend that looking at it that way people consider what Alfred North Whitehead has to say. Process theology. Process thought. However you want to say it. Okay? And so another way you could say this, if you think God hates the workers of iniquity, you could take something like, I'm going to make, I'm going to make some statements, and you're going to understand the statements after I explain them. I could say something like this. If you jump off a tall enough building, you will die. Okay? It's, it's a process. We understand gravity and are, we are smart enough to realize that you don't defy gravity. I mean, of course, you can get into a plane and things like that, but we understand we have two different forces. We have wind resistance, airspeed and airflow and, you know, Boyle's Law, all this kind of stuff. We have that and, and we have gravity and we can get in the flow with that. It's a process. Gravity is a process. Airflow and lift is a process. We understand these processes so that if we get in the proper flow with them, we can use them in the same way that uh, a sailboat uses the wind to make himself go forward, to propel himself forward with a sail. So it's, it's like... It's like understanding reality like a river and getting in proper flow with it. Getting in proper relation to the flow of the river of reality is really what we're trying to do here. Um, I could say something like, if you don't eat and stay active, you will get weak. And you will eventually die if you don't eat at all. Or I could say something like this. The river is not friendly to those who sleep in their canoe. All right? And you could say the river of reality is not friendly to those who stay sleeping in their canoe of first-tier consciousness. Which is why he says, wherefore he saith, Awake thou that sleepest, arise from the dead, and Christ shall give thee light. When people are in their first-tier consciousness, all this stuff up here, they are asleep in the canoe on the river of reality. They're not in attunement with reality. They're not in right relationship with reality. They are as asleep as can be. And, and if you might be thinking of a canoe on a peaceful, serene river, uh, think of a canoe and like where you would go white water rafting, okay? You gotta wake up and you better get in attunement with that river quick or it's gonna kill you. The same river... We, had, we just, I live in Baton Rouge. We just had somebody, I think two weeks ago, die in the Mississippi River. The same river that can help you transport millions of dollars worth of goods every day can also kill you dead. All right? And so the flow of reality, the Mississippi River, hates the workers of iniquity. Hates people who aren't in right relationship with it. Not that it is exhibiting any particular decisive hatred toward anything, but it's just you got to be in right relationship with that thing or it's going to bite you. It's going to get you. That's how it is. 
So to say that God hates all the workers of iniquity, it's that kind of thing to where the reality that is God is has a particular flow to it. And if you do not get an atonement with that flow, it will kill you. It and you know the word sowing and reaping, hate in the east they use the phrase karma. Okay? The river is not friendly to those who sleep in their canoe, and the river of reality is not friendly to those who sleep in their canoe of first-tier consciousness. Wake up. Our understanding of God, I've asked you, seek to never have a static model of God. And the Jews are pretty smart about this. They avoid saying the name God altogether. And if you're ever in an online discussion with them, they will type G underscore D because they take that kind of thing very seriously. But the, uh, any static model of God is idolatry. It is profanity. And you want to avoid that at all costs. And that's one of the problems with all of our, uh, our church model people who have followed after the world and created worldly versions of churches where we have propositional statements that are killing people. Propositional statements instead of actually worshiping God. We got that from the world. That's 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 us being worldly and secular. We didn't get that from God. So there are some things that share the attributes of God, and I want to share these with you. If they're too small, I'm gonna make this a little bit bigger. The future shares some attributes of God. You realize the future is all knowing. The future is omnipresent. It's immutable. You cannot stop what it will bring. It is omnipotent. It has all the power to do what it's going to do. Guess what you do to this future? You sacrifice to the future. Do you ever pay for a college course? You sacrifice to the future. You must keep it pleased. Do you ever save any money in a bank? You must keep it pleased. If you do not keep the future pleased, it will judge you harshly. What else has some attributes of God? The law of sowing and reaping. Guess what? It is all-knowing. It is omnipresent. It's everywhere. It is immutable. You cannot stop it. It is omnipotent. It's all-powerful. You sacrifice to it, and you must keep it pleased. That's the law of sowing and reaping. We're not even talking about something that is animate here. Your future self. As far as you are concerned, your future self is all-knowing. As far as you are concerned, your future self is omnipresent because it will have been everywhere you have been. And your future self will judge you harshly. When, you th- when, when the concept of God comes to my head, I start thinking of things like this rather than an old man with a beard sitting on a cloud. Okay? Because these are the practical things that give me existentially what, my, what I need to carry forward in the spirit of my journey. I need to be in a right relationship with these things. Other concepts that expand our understanding of God. Perhaps the concept of the numinous. Or you could say everything in the unknown is God. You could say that. Now notice these are not dogmatic statements. These are things to help us not have a static model of God. A network of collective consciousnesses. Thanks Donald Hoffman. That which judges your future judges you, your posterity will judge you. Think about how we all judge Adolf Hitler, okay? Your future self. The market is a collective consciousness. It is a distributed cognition. Um, the combined actions and thoughts and states of being for all things throughout all time and eternity. You can think of that as God in a way. That which does not think. By the way, if God... You say, well, it doesn't make any sense. If God is all-knowing, do you realize that that would also mean that he could never think? Because as soon as he thought, as soon as he had a thought, that would be something else to know. Therefore, it would have to be something that does not think. That which never reacts. That which is always proactive, always ahead of the game. It is never reactive. That which is inevitable. You can think of God that way. That which is inevitable is God. Created all things out of nothing. Uh, that which will come to pass, that kind of thing. Um, all people believe in these things. If, you, if, you, like, if you're talking to an atheist, 
And this is some sometimes this works better in person than online. Trust me on that. <laughs> but you can test it out. Every atheist believes in everything that's highlighted right there. Every atheist does. All people believe it. Some people use the label God to refer to some of these things. The hierarchical arrangement, oops, God could be the hierarchical arrangement of that which is. Or maybe something like the Akashic Record. Or just that which is. So when it when it comes to God, and there's some other models that I that I use, which some people aren't quite ready for, but I like to entertain the dramatic view of God. And I like to entertain fractally the idea of what I call a traumatized dramatic view of God. Something like uh, if somebody is traumatized and they wind up with dissociative identity disorder and they might wind up with 17 different personalities all floating around in their head because everyone's head is not, you think of yourself as one person, but actually you are a network of collective consciousnesses. And if we were to cut your corpus callosum, you could try to get something out of the cabinet with one hand while the other hand is trying to shut the cabinet and stop you from doing it. All those things are already in there right now, but you mediate them and you bring them. Isn't there a part of you that wants to get up and go to the gym and a part of you that doesn't? Isn't there a part of you that uh, wants to eat the cupcake and a part of you that doesn't? You think of yourself as one unified individual because you have all these things unified with, with a command tower up in the top of your head. Well, some people get injured and they no longer have, they, all these different things are no longer unified. And they all have their own will, and there's nothing, there's nothing pulling them into some kind of unification. So when the Bible talks about there was a war in heaven, and the fall, and the curse, I think of this fractally, it's almost like the entire cosmos is one individual that has a head injury, and has split into billions of different personalities. And then when uh, Christ reconciles them all back together, that is the reunification of of everything back into the the unified person, the unified individual. And like I said, these aren't dogmas. These are just kind of thought experiments to that that help me interface with reality in many cases, that help me be more compassionate with people and, and give me insights and parts of understanding with with people. Um, but I don't stick with any of these as high confidence margin, this is an ontological reality. Because we've reduced religion to having a proper description of ontological reality that we can make explicit. But what religion is supposed to be is rebinding us to what is real, to your authentic self, to God. Religion is supposed to be rebinding you to that. And what it should do, instead of you thinking you're right with the correct ontological description of what is, you need to have something with you to carry forward to act appropriately on your journey. That's what it's supposed to equip you with. And that's what you need to know that you need to take with you. Somebody says, check out the Elder Scrolls metaphysics. That's the uh, second person that's told me to check out Skyrim, which I have downloaded and have not started playing yet. So what I've done in the next sheet here, Romans 7, and I'm not making it, I'm making it, I'm keeping it small on purpose because the point isn't to read all the eaches again. The point is this. This is all Paul talking about himself. And if God hates the workers of iniquity, you could say God hates everything that's in red ink and loves everything that's in blue ink. And it's the same person. It's the same person. So once again, where did I have this? Yeah, that's right. That's, that's all the bad stuff. So back before when I was showing you, here's all the good stuff. Here's, here's the whole chart of our development and culturation, et cetera, and so forth. And where we are, this is the good stuff that survives and this is the stuff that will burn up <laughs> when tried by fire, First, First Corinthians chapter 3. This stuff is burning up. Wood, hay, and stubble. 
This is what will last. And so this stuff is the red ink. Here, God hates all the workers of iniquity. That's what he hates. He does not hate the stuff in blue. He does not hate that part of you. And the dividing line between good and evil runs through every human heart. So another way you could perhaps word this is, the future is, this is my stab at paraphrasing in a way that the idea here is to break you away from your model of God. When you thou hatest all workers of iniquity, you're thinking of a man sitting on a cloud with a long gray beard, having hate and malice toward particular people. And that is an idolatrous model of God. So how do we break us free of that idolatry and see the verse anew? I'm going to reword it. The future and the law of sowing and reaping is not friendly to the, to the workers of iniquity. If you are a robber, you will go to jail or you will get killed by your compadres. It will not turn out well for you, that kind of thing. And you will tarnish your soul and never be in right relationship with yourself, not to mention... And you are not your actions. You are not any of those things. So, what we've done in this video, um, <laughs> Seraphim said, I don't even know who you are anymore, said my 18-year-old self to my 48-year-old self. I had a, when I was five, I stood in front of a mirror and I'm like, remember what this is like and when you turn 20, I want you to come back and tell me what it's like. I did that when I was five. <laughs> And every once in a while, I think back to my past self. And I'm like, this is what it's like to be uh, old and fat. That's what it's like. It's Paul Tillich's ultimate concern. Your ultimate concern is your God, is your de facto God, right? How people act tells you more about what they really believe than anything that they claim to affirm. So we looked at three different things. We looked at... Uh, does God hate some people? And then we looked at the outer man versus the inner man. And then we looked at our understanding of God. And when you, when you bring all these things together, we have, this, we have this understanding that emerges. That Paul and John made it very clear that yes, there is still sin, but that part of us that sins is not the real us. The I myself and my mind survive the spirit of God. I'm serving God with my mind, the law of God with my mind, and with my flesh, the law of sin and death. But what I want us to do is to work on separating out the false self from the authentic self I want you to realize where you are on your transformation journey that might look something like this. Realize where you are on that and start thinking about what kind of practices that you can do to kind of wake up to the difference between your authentic self and your ego self. And we suggested some of these already like so. Practicing yourself in observation mode as a third party. Become the watcher. Become the witness. You can start off doing this in meditation. Be still and know that I am God. And think of your thoughts this way, but also in all your daily activities. Oh, this is the kind of guy who leans back in his chair. And it'll take time to start thinking this way. Remember to be the bigger. Be the bigger background. Separate from what you observe. Great peace have they which love thy law, and nothing shall offend them. Be bigger than what you really are and realize that you are not just your ego and strive to maintain this perspective and see this interface with the witness and others. In other words, realize that behind each pair of eyes that you look into when you're, when you're dealing with people, that there's an authentic self back in there too and see if there's a way that you can relate to that if you can. Those are the three things we looked at. Now the chat's been fun. It seems like everybody's behaving themselves pretty much. 
<clears throat> and tomorrow we're going to have Seraphim back on here and we're going to talk about part two of the Perusia. And we're also going to be doing a video on 1 Corinthians 3, 8 and uh, why that doesn't support Calvinism. And we're going to be talking about the first Avatar movie coming soon to a YouTube screen near you. Thanks for watching. May the Lord bless you and good day.